Yeah, I mean, the topic of the feasibility of, of a monarchy into the mid to late 20th century is a sort of, um, I'm not sure I, I, what I had considered actually ever giving a talk on something like that. But it is, I think, the feasibility. I mean, the, I suppose the question really is, is it, would it have been possible? Um, and I, my answer to that is that I would, to, in order to actually give an answer, it's necessary to go back a bit and even then to give a background to what is, after all, the Egyptian monarchy and what sort of political system did that represent and how did that emerge. And I think that's the more important aspect, really, as opposed to uh, the monarchy itself. It is, I mean, well, I'll get into that, but basically um, the monarchy in Egypt and, the, and the stru more of really the, st the political structure that supported it. Uh, the monarchy really begins in the 19th century with the founding of uh, basically uh, what we would call modern Egypt by a viceroy by the name of Muhammad Ali. Uh, Muhammad Ali had been a, uh, a basically a commander of one of the mercenary units who essentially was one of the contenders for power in Egypt in post-French occupation Egypt, 1811, where the country is still in the, in a, in the process of ferment. Uh, Mamluks are still uh, basically uh, on the scene. And uh, he is selected in many respects by the ulama of Egypt in a very, very classic way of, of bringing forth a viceroy uh, or leadership, which is basically through the acclamation of elders. And Amar Makram, who is the man who brought him in, who is the man who actually petitions the Sultan to give the viceroyalty to Muhammad Ali in 1811. And that's essentially when, he, well, 1809, and that's essentially when the beginning of the Egyptian monarchy really begins, uh, really starts. And it's, it's essentially this Muhammad Ali character who comes in on the scene. He is uh, and begins as a viceroy of the Ottoman state. And I mean, Egypt is a possession of, of, of the Ottoman state, but the Ottoman state is not an empire as we understand the point today. It's not like the British in India. The Ottoman state is the Ottoman Caliphate. It's also the Ottoman, it's, it's a multi-ethnic unified culture. It's, uh, it doesn't work along the same lines as the Western European analogy of that period or even of a later date. Uh, uh, in fact, we note that those who actually run the show are half the time not even themselves ethnically Turks because it's not an ethnic entity. Uh, Muhammad Ali, by the same token, is a viceroy appointed by them. And essentially, over the pas passage of a few decades, uh, there is a confrontation between the Viceroy of Egypt and the Ottoman, the sublime port, uh, uh, which essentially comes, I mean, the, 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 the Egyptians under Muhammad Ali win for themselves a position of, to a degree, autonomy and a viceregal hereditary system where the, the family of Muhammad Ali were now the hereditary viceroys of Egypt under the Ottoman Caliphate. Um, and that's really the beginnings of, 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 the, of, of modernity, if we like, uh, in a political sense. It had already happened before in the sense that Muhammad Ali also builds up an economy, builds up a military, uh, and that military is what really guarantees the security of Egypt to all comers for quite a while, including the British for quite a while. Um, but the real crux comes when the generation of young men who are sent by the Muhammad Ali system to Europe to be educated in France, mostly many in Britain, uh, return to Egypt and start applying what they learn. Uh, uh, most important of whom is his, basically his grandson. Uh, his name was Ismail. And Ismail had essentially received a military and civil education in Europe. He had attended, um, he'd been in one of the scholastic missions, in the Prince's Mission, uh, which was between 1844 and 1849. Uh, he'd attended the military academy at Saint-Cyr, uh, and he, and not just himself, but also the, the class he went with, but more important, they had been witnesses to the 1848 liberal revolutions that had swept Europe at that time. And um, this had affected them. We know this from their individual writings. They kind of talk about it. They also, I might add, uh, have acquired French as a language. So in many respects, uh, French is already becoming a very much the language of the absorption of mod modernity of that period, which is a sort of interesting and rather practical uh, language in which to absorb such a thing uh, 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 at that time. But Ismail essentially becomes viceroy in 1863. 
Uh, I'm not going to really talk about what, what he does because he does preside over this terrible debt that, that Egypt had incurred. Uh, I won't really get into that so much, but really I'm, I'm, I just want to point out that in his reign, he begins a system of a modern political uh, uh, system. And he really, not, not that he doesn't have any choice in the matter, but he has at his disposal an entire generation of Egyptian officials who have received a European education, who are come from to a degree, intellectual backgrounds from Egypt already, and have acquired a certain, uh, cer more than that, I mean, modern, modern governance among us, amongst other things, and modern ideas from their exposure as students in Europe. And it is with them that they attempt to create a modern society. Um, it's not easy. The debt, the creditors, there is uh, an overweening British and, and French influence. France, until the 1871 war, is in many respects a guarantor of Egyptian, uh, uh, um, uh, shall we say, uh, independence from European incursion. Egypt is still a dependency of the Ottoman state. It is still paying uh, and has to respond to Ottoman uh, control, although that control is very much dissipated by Ismail in his dealings with the Ottoman state by basically reducing, reducing through a variety of methods that he applies. But most important is the fact that they, they do decide to build a political edifice, and a parliament is built in 1866. And it is really the beginning of a proper, uh, it's no longer, s how, would, how would I put it, the diktat of an, of an oriental despot anymore. It had been, but now this was changing. And uh, the initial parliaments begin to, to, to expand, specifically because of the debt, the debt that's in, that's, that's in place, because the debt weakens the monarch, and at the same time, the uh, foreign incursion is weakening the Khedive Ismail as well. Uh, you have uh, elements amongst his, his entourage like Nubar who have completely changed sides and who are now actually the agents of, Europe, of the Europeans in Egypt as opposed to the agents of the Khedive in dealing with the West. Uh, at the same time, this debt is, is crippling. But, I mean, I've, I, you know, there's been a lot that has actually been written on Khedive Ismail and the debt that was, that was incurred. But I think a lot less has been written on actually what the money was actually used for. And I think it is important to at least mention the fact that uh, uh, the money was used for massive infrastructural projects in, in the country, that um, I think something like 8,000 miles of canals were built, 400 bridges. Uh, I, I made a little list here because I thought it was rather interesting to, to actually look at that. But most, in my view, what was most significant here were the one and a quarter million fedans of land that were reclaimed from into agricultural property. Uh, agriculturally producing property. And I'm not sure that any subsequent head of state in Egypt has actually matched that in any 17-year period subsequent to this period. In any case, um, uh, in political terms, uh, he uh, goes along with the idea of a liberal constitution, which in itself comes through with the idea of jettisoning Sharia law. Sharia law is removed from the equation in about 1877. Code Napoleon is adopted in 1878. And this is an Egyptian uh, uh, effort. And it's an effort undertaken by uh, a broad, broad sections of society at the time. There is a debate on the issue. And it's not a recent debate. It was a debate that's been going on for several decades. But it is, the ball is taken by, in the, 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 the matter itself is taken, taken in hand by uh, uh, led by the, the constitutional program of Sharif Pasha. And it is, to a degree, implemented. You get something that comes out of it in 1879, is the Lehe Wataneya government. Um, this has also been, there's been, I mean, I find there's a, lot of, there's a lot of documentation that's been written on this. Uh, a lot of it has been written through European sources. Uh, I have to say uh, much that has been written is reeks of a lot of prejudice. It suggests that the Egyptians themselves really not really capable of governing their own, their own, uh, uh, their own affairs. And that in this particular Ehawataneya situ situation, that it is really the Khedive that is the puppet master uh, with puppets at his disposal. And I would, I would not agree with that. This is not quite that way. That's not what's happening. On the contrary, uh, what you're looking at is the emergence of a real in intellectually based, well-educated uh, 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 
entourage that is beginning to see a threat to their position and beginning to see that the only way out of this is to make a, a system of governance that will rely on a constitution, preferably a liberal constitution, and preferably one that will take Ismail away from governing the country and ruling and being a constitutional reigning head of state. Now, to what degree that came about, we're really not given much of a chance to find out because very soon and very rapidly, uh, Ismail is deposed by uh, Demarche, brought about by the British and the French at that time, uh, through Bismarck, who uh, basically, and the Khedive is deposed, which essentially brings to mind, at least for Egyptian circles of that period, uh, to what degree are the, um, the European powers really committed to a liberal constitutional system in a country like Egypt, where would it not, oft, after all, be preferable to have an oriental despot? Would it not be preferable for at least imperial requirements to have an oriental despot who would basically carry out one's instructions rather than having to deal with a local parliament, with a local, uh, a local native parliament, <coughs> which in many respects is not really considered acceptable? And I think there is, there is a possibility that this also comes, uh, comes to play. And it's certainly something that's picked up by the successor of Ismail, who does try and go back a little bit to the despotic rule, which in turn provokes... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm rushing through this a bit, because it's actually this, this ground has been covered a great deal. But the point I'm really making here is that, that the idea of a constitution, the idea of a modern system of governance, has been in place in a country like Egypt uh, well, let's not say a full democracy, but certainly a representational system since the 1870s, 1880s. Um, the Arabi, there's Arabi mutiny, which attempts to bring back a constitutional system, which actually doesn't work and, 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 and is in itself uh, sabotaged by a, an, again, a French and British démarche through the joint note of January 1882, which basically... Uh, provokes a, to a de facto, not de jure, but certainly de facto military junta under uh, Arabi, which in turn brings about and provokes the British occupation of Egypt in, uh, in later that year. By, and by September, Arabi has been defeated. The Arabists are sort of finished, and, and Egypt is really now facing a long-term, although at the time they did not think so, a long-term British occupation. Uh, and that's essentially how it begins. Um, so we... So we actually have already uh, a, a, a situation where a lot of efforts had been done by Egyptians for their own uh, self betterment, if you like, in, in their own political system, in their own socio-economic situation. Um, uh, they, they, it, a lot of it, it's, oddly enough, is, it's, it's criticized by the Western observer as being, well, not enough, and, and after all, they're just natives, and, and, they, and, and it's either that or the indolent Turk. And I, again, I don't, I don't agree with these things, especially when one looks at, the, at just the size of the work undertaken at that time by these people. I mean, the complete jettisoning of a legal system and incorporation of a totally alien and different one is an amazing, uh, it's, a, 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 it's an amazing achievement. I mean, the, the adoption of Kurt Napoleon in its entirety, just like that, and it takes time, of course, but, but it's a commitment, is, it's quite something. Uh, in any case, the British take over, and we sort of have to wait until uh, 1923, at the end of the First World War, for an independent Egypt to really start emerging out of all this. Uh, and this independent Egypt of 1923, of the monarchy of Egypt, is uh, one that is, emerges also with a constitutional system. Uh, the 1923 constitution is very very imperfect. And actually, what I should do is really start reading this because I'm actually talking off the cuff a little bit. But I actually wrote it all down much more, much better. So if you'll allow me, I'm not quite used to this. But anyway, uh, let me do it that way, perhaps. Hold on. Uh, where was I? Yes, here we go. It's an imperfect document. And the monarchy uh, had extensive powers, which included the right to select and appoint prime ministers, dismiss cabinets, dissolve parliament, and appoint one-fifth of the members of the Senate. Uh, these of provisions, when introduced, met with such opposition from the political parties and the terms of the Constitution would become the subject of much political fighting between the various factions. And over the next few years, uh, this was the constant tug of war of political life in Egypt, was between the various political parties, the palace and the pr British presence in the background. At times, there were periods when the Constitution was suspended 
In addition, this was the constant resistance, there was the constant resistance to British involvement in Egyptian affairs. Uh, ultimately, 19, it, 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 eventually 1936 is essentially the watershed year in which for the political process in Egypt, King Fuad passes away in Cairo, his underage son, King Farouk, is, is placed under a Regency Council, and the 1936 treaty with Britain is signed. And I, this is an interesting uh, document. The Anglo-Egyptian 1936 treaty uh, was a first step to the complete removal of a British influence over Egyptian affairs. Uh, among other things, it promised an evacuation of British military personnel to the Suez Canal area within 10 years. It had certain security pr uh, provisions in the event of general war, but on the whole, it was an Egyptian achievement. And it was an achievement uh, pretty much brought about by a, an Egyptian leadership, a political leadership, that was in itself very pol uh, intellectually advanced in, in itself. I mean, a lot of the, uh, the, the political parties and the formation by then that had emerged were themselves based on one of the, the ulama. A lot of them were ulama from ulama backgrounds, which essentially meant they came from a juridical, religious background based on Sharia law. Once Kud Napoleon had been applied, you find that many of these families immediately send their sons who are, who are supposed to become Sharia experts for are now all sent to Sorbonne to learn Code Napoleon. Essentially, it's not to lose their position of preeminence and their position of prestige within Egypt. Uh, quite a few of them are by this time now in positions of authority in the political system. Uh, they're not the only ones. It's also multi-confessional in the sense that you also have uh, a, a significant, for example, the Weft has a significant Christian uh, element which is involved in its governance, uh, and you also have uh, members of the Jewish community who are serving as senators. So it's, it's not just anymore a, a Muslim uh, 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 diktat, and it never really had been other, at least, well, in the background, I think you're looking at uh, the, the Muslim element had usually been the policy-making element in, in the past, going back very far. Uh, those not Muslim were usually in administrative capacities without the ability to make policy. And this is something that comes out also of the Mamluk era that we see this. Um, essentially, they do, uh, but still this idea of, of the monarchy and the palace having a little bit too much power and not really making it into a completely constitutional monarchy as we understand the term. Uh, is still in the system, and there is an effort to try and, and, and reduce this. 1940, there was a committee organized through Parliament, made up of some very interesting, interesting people and significant people uh, like uh, Makram Abid, the Sheikh al Meraghi, Azam Pasha, Hassouna, uh, Aziz al Masri, in order to abate somewhat the influence and to try and bring in a, f a few modifications to the Constitution. The British were not really for this. So this was in 1940, there was a crisis as far as they were concerned, and it was not time for this sort of, uh, in their view, uh, kind of nonsense to be, to be engaged in at this, uh, with the Germans at the gates, really. Um, the war is, is not, I mean, basically the war is fought in Egypt, is fought on Egyptian territory. Um, but it's not really, uh, I'm, I'm going very quickly here, not going into too much detail really, because this, this one can really it's get lost here, there's a lot here. But essentially the war itself was very, I mean, uh, the, the British were very concerned about, in fact were convinced that the monarchy was plotting with the Axis, which was total nonsense really, and that comes out later, simply because the Germans themselves had a, an Egyptian candidate for the throne of Egypt, had they come into Egypt, and, and they knew it. I mean, uh, King Farouk knew, knew that. Uh, he was in the band by the name of Mansur Daoud. Uh, the point is that uh, the British were and wanted to make sure that the Egyptians would toe the line. And in order for them to toe the line, uh, you have the emergence of the Abdin incident in 1942. Uh, and the Abdin incident had actually been brought about by the insistence of the British that the Egypt should should get rid, in fact they wanted Egypt to declare war against the Axis. The Egyptians were not really convinced, the Egyptian government was not convinced that it should declare war, especially as it wasn't really sure as who would win this war. And declaring war against the Axis in the event that the British might lose was not a really a good proposition. So they were not interested in doing that. So the British were pushing for the, for the dismissal of what they considered to be a Vichy French ambassador, Monsieur Posy. 
Uh, and for the, the king himself basically said, no, I mean, they're not really, he's not a member of the Vichy, he's our fa the ambassador from before Vichy here, and we have no interest in dismissing him. The British were putting a lot of pressure on this. Uh, Farouk basically was abroad in, in the Wahat, in, the, uh, on, on, in Upper Egypt and through the, uh, um, uh, the um, oasises. And the government basically, in his absence, succumbs to this pressure and dismisses Monsieur Posey, which essentially is unconstitutional, simply because uh, the, any, any accredited diplomat in Cairo in Egypt has to be dismissed by the head of state because he is accredited to the head of state and not necessarily the cabinet. So it creates a constitutional crisis. Anyway, the point is the British felt that this was time now for the WEFT government to be in place. They attempt to coerce it. Farouk is not so convinced, but anyway, it culminates in British tanks breaking into Abdin Palace and imposing this situation. Uh, and this went a long way in destroying the prestige of the monarchy in Egypt. Um, certainly, it, 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 it provokes some extraordinary, in a, certain extraordinary situations. I mean, you have a moment where, for example, Anwar Sadat meets in, this, in the week of Abdin. Anwar Sadat meets with, uh, with who is actually a, a conspirator in the army at the time, meets with the Sheikh al-Banna with the idea of joining forces between the Muslim Brotherhood and the emergent uh, conspiracy and cell structures in the army. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an interesting situation. But the point is that, that it, uh, uh, the end of the war eventually happens. And of course, the, the weft had been uh, completely discredited. But the end of the war also brings with it other problems. I mean, the British are on their way out. But at the same time, uh, what's, happened in it, what's happened in the world is that the idea of violent resistance has become a norm. And you're getting now violent resistance towards the British in Egypt. Uh, you're getting uh, a political expression through more, uh, more, shall we say, uh, 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 fanatic elements, if you like. Uh, uh, for example, the guerrilla campaign against the British in the Canal Zone, undertaken by the Brotherhood, as well as other nationalist elements, including, the, uh, to a degree, the Mrs. Fatet people. Uh, but the point is that you're beginning now to, to have a situation where there's a crumbling of a uh, where the political parties are no longer controlling the political expression of the country, that other parties are beginning to, to er corrode their own influence and their own constituencies are being lost. So to what degree now do the political parties within this liberal constitutional system, imperfect as it is, uh, are they controlling, s controlling matters? They're working very hard to try and keep that control. And in a way, it's a sort of tug and war. But it's still a, a constitutional system in the sense that we're not looking at a, 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 uh, a dictatorial monarchy here. We're looking at a monarchy which has a little too, little too much influence over the parliamentary system, but it's still a parliamentary system. And ultimately, it is this uh, system which has to now, which has already had to face the Second World War, it now has to face the partition of Palestine the emergence of a uh, basically an alien and hostile state in Israel across the border. And it, 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 it engages in a war, which turns out disastrously, which goes a long way in, in, uh, in demolishing more of the prestige of the monarchy and the prestige of, of the system itself. Even though that war, that the 1948 war, is not so much uh, a war undertaken by the Egyptian government as such. It's, it's really an, an Arab League war. It's a war undertaken by Hazem. It's a really a war that, after all, because there is the element of the Arab League that is now also coming in post-war, which sees in itself as the vehicle by which a post-colonial policy would be implemented and would be brought, it brought about. Um, under the very dynamic leadership of Azam, Abdurrahman Azam was an extremely interesting uh, uh, policy-making entity who is making some very interesting uh, demarches and very potent demarches, even though they fail. Of course, they're not really military experts, but they fail abysmally in handling the issue of the partition of Palestine. Um, and Okay, they take their lesson. They have plans for the future. They're never implemented, I might add. But the point is that all in all, the situation has deteriorated where by 1951-52, uh, the, the, the system is, 
is, uh, there, there, there have been waves of assassinations. There is, uh, the, bro the Brotherhood has have been combating the British in the Canal Zone. There is a sense of, 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 um, of it's an instability that, frankly, um, uh, uh, is, is basically holding it together. After the burning of Cairo, things sort of to a degree settle down a little bit. But this is the point where the army makes its move and, ha and does its coup d'etat in 1952. Uh, the question then, this is basically the background, the question then what is would the monarchy really have survived? Uh, the monarchy and its constitutional government, the constitutional liberal system that it, that it came with, because it was not a dictatorial system, was a civilian system of governance. Uh, it was a system of governance that the Revolutionary Command Council that made the coup d'etat also thought should be what should be incorporated um, and should be continued. They themselves also attempt to recreate that, uh, but that doesn't really happen. It doesn't work. Um, uh, in fact, Mohammed Naguib himself is the subject of a counter coup by Gamal Abdel Nasser, and the country slips into a totalitarian state. But the point is, was there a future for a democratic system? I'm saying, yes, there was. Had this coup d'etat been confronted in 52, and there's every evidence that it could have been successfully confronted, uh, the, the system of civilian governments would have continued. In addition, the system of civilian government, governance was based on pretty much a mature leadership. The leadership were not, these were not, these were not, uh, half-educated men who were in charge. These were very well educated. These were men who had been involved in the cut and thrust of a parliamentary system for over now 20 years. They had already uh, addressed the British presence. They had negotiated there, uh, with the British. They had uh, been not been easy negotiating with the British. The British basically had certain things they wanted the Egyptians to do, which the Egyptians were not really willing to do. So there were impasses. Egypt was not in a position to force through any of this, but on the other hand, there was hope in the, s in the sense that the British were a sunset power. They were on their way out anyway. So at some point, they were going to give. It's, there was no question about that. Uh, but when, of course, was the point. Um, in economic terms, which are very important in all this, Egypt was not a, 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 a creditor nation. I mean, it was not a debtor. It, owed no, it uh, really owed no money to anyone. On the contrary, it was a nation which had a... A, a very a reasonably healthy economy. It owed money to no one. It had, I think, something over 30 million pounds or so in gold reserves in the United Kingdom. And it was owed money by the British for services rendered during the Second World War. So in economic terms, it was there. Um, what would it have done in the 50s? Would it, and to what degree would it have confronted Israel? Was it in any condition to have, a, uh, to have a system. And I'm saying, yes, it would have, because the, the structure itself was in place, and the people who could implement such a structure were also there. And basically, that's what I, what I have to say. I'm not used to this, so I mean, but there, there it is, you know.